Good morning all. So just to recap, I have built uh, the oscillator section of the CD4060. In other words, I've placed these uh, resistors and capacitors uh, uh, onto these pins of the chip. So this thing is now oscillating and I should be able to monitor the uh, fundamental frequency, which is here on pin nine. That's actually what I'm looking at at the moment. You may not be able to see it very well, but I've wedged a piece of wire into pin nine of the chip. Then I want to look at these other outputs to see whether they are subdivisions in terms of frequency of this fundamental frequency or the main clock oscillator frequency. So what have we got? Well, here on uh, pin nine, which is the highest frequency on the uh, chip, we've got an oscillation. It's a square wave. Um, the only way you can see what the frequency is, this does have a frequency measuring thing if you press and hold that button. However, it doesn't seem to work if you're in DC coupling. So I will switch it to AC coupling. The waveform goes a bit strange because uh, this is a very low frequency. But we're seeing about four point something hertz. So as I say, a very low frequency. Now, just a quick word about this DSO138 oscilloscope. If you're in slow scan mode, and that's anything uh, slower than what is it? 20 milliseconds is normal mode. 50 milliseconds and slower, the scope is in slow scan mode. And what it's basically doing, let's put it on 0.5 seconds per division, is it's writing to the sample memory. This, this is this wider region here from the right hand side. So it's writing samples in from the right and then shifting the whole screen down. You must be watching it with this little windowed area, which represents your display pushed over to the right hand side. That way you get to see changes like switching to AC or switching to ground. You get to see them straight away. If that little windowed bar isn't over on the right hand side and I will move it, uh, which strangely is plus, I'll push it over to the left a little bit, push it over a bit further, then you don't get to see the changes straight away because you're not watching the far right hand side of the sample memory. So if I switch to AC, it actually takes a while to see that ground. There's a bit of a delay. And uh, if you've got this window either in the middle or, or fully over to the left hand side, and there are reasons why you might want it on the left hand side, you can get very caught out with this because changes on the input aren't reflected immediately on the display. So slow scan mode, Push that little bar to the right hand side. Uh, I think that's by pressing negative. Push it right over to the right hand side. Okay, that's right over to the right hand side. And you will get to see changes in the input with immediate effect. Now, another little anomaly. The diagram, the schematic um, of actually this board shows the outputs of the CD4060 as Q4 to Q14. Fine. The data sheet for the chip shows them as Q3 to Q13 on the same pins. So uh, on one place it's Q3 and in another place it's called Q4. Uh, but we can find out how many divisions from the fundamental clock frequency that is. And I've got a feeling that this is just marked up in a rather strange uh, notation. Right, so if we want to uh, look at the output of Q4, which isn't actually used in this circuit, but it will be oscillating, we need to go to pin seven. I'm currently on pin nine, so let's move that uh, probe. We should get to see the result of that on the scope immediately. Yes, we do. Let's go to pin seven, which is there. And we can see that we've got a much lower frequency now. In fact, if I go any lower, we're gonna have uh, trouble seeing that. I can probably go one more stage. So the next pin is pin five for Q5. That's there. And that took a little while to be actioned, but yeah, that's a lower frequency. So I'm going to have to increase the uh, frequency of the scope. Uh, what's that called? Slow it down, I suppose. Yeah. One second per division now. So we get to see that at a reasonable rate. Okay, let's go to the next Q output, which is pin four. That'll be half the rate again. This is now getting very slow. And it literally is flip-flopping at this rate. So it's just gone low. 
and it will go high, but it's taking quite a long time to do it. Okay, let's go one uh, division slower than that, and that is Q7, which is on pin 6, so that's there. And uh, apart from the contact scratching noise, that will now be oscillating one step even slower. And it's so slow that I just have to talk through it. Okay, it's just gone low. And it takes several seconds to go high again. And this is the rate at which these uh, LEDs are going to change color. Unless, of course, I turn the little pot that's on here. However, it's a very low quality pot. And I get the impression that you can probably only turn that about half a dozen times before it completely falls apart. So there it's gone high and then it will go low again. But it's switching from high to low every several seconds. That's really slow. Now, I need to point out a couple of things about this. I have fitted the 220K resistor. Here it is, 220K, it pulls reset up to VCC. Now, interestingly, this chat chip has, uh, this chap, this chip has an active high reset. So by fitting that 220K, the chip is being held in reset because it's being pulled high by that resistor. So I've also fitted a little wire link here, which is doubling up as a ground point, pulling uh, this point here, which is the anode of one of these diodes, down to ground, actually. I just uh, linked this point directly to ground. So I'm, I have tied the reset input directly to ground, which I think is okay for CMOS. Uh, overriding the effect of this pull-up resistor. Without that, this chip is held in reset and will not oscillate. So by fitting that 220k resistor, I had to override the reset with this wire link, which doubles up as a, a ground point for my scope. Right now, pin 9, which is the main clock frequency, I'm just about getting this measuring at about 4 hertz. Uh, you can see we're at uh, half a second per division, and we've got two peaks per division. So we got two peaks per half a second, that's four peaks per second, which is about four hertz. Now let's go to pin seven, which is the uh, first accessible divided down point. And now we've got, I suppose I should only be looking at the upper peaks. Hmm, how many divisions? Is that eight divisions? Oh, actually I could freeze that. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. What well, about seven? divisions uh, per upper peak and their half second divisions. So it's about, um, what is that? Yeah, so that's about three and a half seconds. Let's say four seconds. It was four hertz and it's now four seconds. That's a division of 16, isn't it? So is it dividing by 16 uh, between the fundamental clock frequency and the first accessible divided output? Let's have a look. Well, that's interesting because if we're calling the uh, main clock frequency, the fundamental frequency Q0, to get a sixteenth of the frequency, we need four divisions. So that'll be from Q0 to Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. So this uh, marking of Q4 on pin 7 works if you call uh, this one here, this pin 9, Q0. Doesn't really work on here because if this is Q3, then this input would have to be Q minus one. So unless they're referring to the first divided stage as Q0, it doesn't really make much sense to call this Q3. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And I've also noticed that on this very weird uh, 4060, not only do you not have a Q0, Q1 or Q2, there's no Q10, it jumps from Q9 straight to Q11. Where's Q10? And if I look at uh, the schematic for this uh, music board, there's no Q11. It jumps, jumps from Q10 to Q12. So there's a missing uh, binary divided output. Now, that doesn't bother us in this circuit because we're only using what uh, the schematic calls Q5, Q6, and Q7. Um, so I think the next thing I want to do is fit uh, the three transistors I'm not going to fit these diodes initially because I want to see what the circuit does without this, uh, what is effectively an AND gate because it's looking for uh, three highs on each of these three outputs. When they're all high, this point doesn't get pulled down to ground. It gets pulled up to VCC 
and the chip is reset. So yes, this is working as an AND gate. Um, when you have one, one, one on these three outputs, the chip is immediately reset. So I'm gonna fit the three transistors and perhaps just one of the LEDs per color group. Um, and we should be looking at a binary count. So we should be looking at one color will oscillate um, at, at uh, a certain speed. The next color will oscillate at half that speed and the third color will oscillate at half the speed again. Should we see whether that actually happens in practice? Oh, the other thing you may have noticed is that we're not hearing that horrendous music, which quite honestly, I got so fed up with, I couldn't listen to anymore. And that's because I've desoldered uh, the 10K resistor from the base of the transistor just temporarily so that I don't have to listen to happy birthday to you while I'm trying to work out what this chip's doing. Right, now I've got a slight problem here. This ground link that I put in uh, can no longer go to one of these transistor holes because I'm about to put the transistors in. Uh, but I've discovered I can run it down to this point here, negative, which is also ground. So I'm going to put it from the uh, diode anode, because I'm not fitting the diodes just yet, down to this uh, negative point, and then I've still got somewhere I can put my oscilloscope uh, ground point, although I probably won't use the oscilloscope now, but uh, I'll leave that in just for the time being. Uh, and of course that wire is pulling this uh, reset pin of the chip down to ground, so I do need this wire to remain in, otherwise the chip won't run. Right, I'm fitting the three transistors in now. They don't tell you what the transistors are on the silk screen. They don't need to because they're all the same. But uh, here it is, they're actually 9012s. Now, here's a gotcha. Um, all of these resistors, which are the LED resistors, uh, on the diagram they're here, they're in series with the LEDs to limit current. They're marked 200. Now, often when you see 200, it actually means 20 because it's two, zero, and then the next zero is a multiplier. Uh, zero means 10 to the power of zero, or anything to the power of zero is one. So you would multiply 20 by one and get 20. Uh, the other way of looking at it is that the multiplier tells you how many more zeros there are. So you have 20 with no more zeros. So that would read 20 if this was any other component. But uh, no, these are 200 ohm resistors. So uh, you can tell that really by the fact that they are, they are the LED series resistors. You wouldn't want 20 ohms here because you'd be pumping a lot of current from VCC through this transistor down to ground. So no, these are 200 ohms. A uh, bit of a gotcha, that one. And if you want to see that actually on the resistor, it's here. Uh, the resistors are 2000. Zero, zero, zero. So it's 200, zero, zero, that's 200, and then the multiplier, which is 10 to the power of the zero, so it's one. So these resistors are marked 200 ohms, uh, exactly the same as the 200 up here, it's just that you've got a different number of initial digits before the multiplier. It's all very confusing. And uh, because these are four band resistors, I think a quick check in the tester is warranted here. Let's just make sure these come up as 200 ohms. And yes, it's 196.5 ohms. Now I'm just gonna fit one of each color of the LEDs and I can't quite fathom out where to put the resistors. So I think I'll put the LEDs in first. And I've just printed out uh, one of the pictures from eBay. Uh, so a red LED in the central four, green to the left and yellow to the top. So let's put those in now. Uh, watch the LED orientation because the three, although the three that I've put in, the yellow, red and green, all have the flat at the top, that's not the case with all of them. In fact, they're on all four sides. Uh, top, left, bottom, oh, maybe not right. And uh, now that I've fitted my LEDs, it's a much easier task to uh, work out from the routings on the back of the board. So, for example, I can see, uh, is that a resistor? Yes, that's a 200 ohm resistor. So one will need to go in there. Uh, one will need to go in there. And for the, oh, it's actually these three here. So that's nice and easy. Right, that's the three uh, 200 ohm resistors in and three of the LEDs. Now each LED has its own current limiting resistor. So it doesn't matter that I've only fitted one of each color. Let's power this up and see what we get. Ah, all LEDs on. One has gone off. 
Ah, right. This is counting down because that's uh, one zero zero. That's zero one one. If I turn that this way round, zero one zero. So that's two. And zero zero one. So that's one. This is counting down in binary. Why is it counting down? Zero seven. Then it'll go one one zero, which is six. Right. So why is it counting down? <laughs> Right, I think I see what's happening. Um, this transistor is working as an inverter. So when this uh, output pulls low, then current flows through the resistor, the LED, and the transistor to ground, because this is a PNP. So actually what we're seeing is the inverse of an up count on this uh, ripple divider. We're seeing it as a down count. Let's have another look. Right, I've sped it up a bit by turning that pot. That's probably one of its nine lives used up. Uh, okay, seven, six, five, one, oh, one, four, one hundred, three is oh, one, one, two is oh, one, oh, one is double, oh, one. So, yes, this is doing a down count in binary. I'm not sure I'd call that uh, a dreamy light sequence, particularly, but at least it's working without current limiting resistors in the uh, transistors, I think there might be a good reason why that works because we're getting an inherent current limit through this 200 ohm resistor. It does seem rather a lot of current to put through the base of the transistor, but I guess it doesn't mind particularly. The current's going to be flowing between collector, between emitter and collector anyway. It doesn't really matter. Really, what it's doing is it's stressing the outputs of this chip. Is that getting warm? No. Perhaps it will when I've got all the LEDs in, but no, for the moment, that seems okay. Now, couple this rather impressive binary light uh, flashing sequence with a bit of music. Oh, that's just dreamy. Maybe not quite so dreamy. So, okay, the next thing is to get uh, more of these LEDs in. Um, but actually, before I do that, and maybe I won't even bother, um, we need to see what the effect of putting these three diodes in is. Now, I'm pretty certain that the purpose of it is to prevent this, which is the zero state, because you don't want, in your dreamy light sequence, all the LEDs to be off. So, what it's going to do is when this thing reaches hmm, the 111 state, ah, now that's the 000 state, really, isn't it? Because we're looking at the inverse when we're looking at these LEDs. Um, these diodes will all be taken high, which means that this point will be pulled high by the 220K resistor and the chip will reset. Let's take out my wire link, because I don't need it, fit the three diodes and see if the zero state, the all off state, disappears. Okay, so I've taken my wire link out, the one that was pulling uh, this reset input to ground and therefore stopping this thing being reset. I've taken it out, but I haven't put yet to put the diodes in. So the chip is going to be permanently now in reset, courtesy of that 220K resistor. And you can see there that uh, it's not counting, and these three LEDs are on, which means that the three outputs are all zeros. So it's stuck at zero, it's reset, it's not counting, it's just held there. Let's get the diodes in and see what they do. Right, the diodes are in. Let's see what it does. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, seven. <laughs> Yay! So it misses out the zero count, which means that you're never in a position where you've got no LEDs on. One, seven. Yeah, that's very clever. And uh, that's the purpose of the three diodes simply so that you're not left in the dark. Right, so all I need to do now is uh, fit the remaining 200 ohm resistors and all the remaining LEDs, and I could if I wanted to fit this uh, two-pin JST connector, but I'm not sure I'm going to bother because I've got uh, the USB socket in this kit. So let's get soldering. Okay, the resistors are all in. Now for the LEDs. And the red ones are in. The green ones are in. And uh, the yellow LEDs are in. So they're all in now. And now this is a connection without having 
pre-rehearsed this, so let's hope they all work. Yay! They all come on. Two groups, two different groups. If we just consider these three like we were doing before, we can still see that binary count. So there's seven, six, five, four, one, zero, zero, three, two, one, and there's no zero. So there's no point where the lights don't come on at all. So that's it. It's finished apart from the uh, music. Actually, I suppose I ought to solder that really. Let's do that now. Let's put that back on. Solder that back onto the base of the transistor. And now we'll get the full effect of lights and music. I'm glad I didn't peel that sticker off. Of course, there's no synchronization between the music and the lights. You could attempt to do that by tweaking that pot, but I wouldn't bother. And that's good because I've learned something. I've learned all about the CD4060 because I never really knew anything about that chip being a, a TTL boy, not a CMOS boy. But I feel like I know this chip now as well as any TTL chip. So that's it really. That's the uh, Dream Light Birthday Gift Suite, otherwise known as the Music Fancy Lantern Suite. And uh, if you enjoyed this style of video where I take a kit and I really drill down into exactly how it works and make modifications to make it do slightly different things as well so that we learn something about the components that are being used, how about on this video giving it a big thumbs up? Cheerio!